Welcome to another episode of the Compass Equip Podcast. We are your hosts, Hayden and Evan. Hello, Compass. And at Compass Bible Church, we exist to make disciples of Jesus Christ by reaching people for Christ, teaching people to be like Christ, and training people to serve Christ. And everything we do here at Compass, including this podcast, everything. is to fulfill everything. All. Pos. Isn't that the Greek word for all? Yeah. Is to fulfill that mission of reaching, teaching, and training. Well, we are picking up an old series. We're back, baby. We're back. Kingdom Happiness, in this sermon, entitled Pure in Heart from Matthew 5, 8, says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's a much shorter text than what's been preached here lately. Which, it's a short text. What was your point? The point of that text was that anyone who desires a relationship with God today and for eternity must undergo a complete transformation wherein their heart, soul, mind, and body are ruled by Christ through our unconditional surrender to Him. And so, with that point, you uh, also, by the way, they're on your worksheet. They are. That's new. Yeah, you should have it on your worksheet. Um, but we have three points under that main point, which is point number one: you must be pure in God's valuation. Uh, a couple quick questions before yeah. we do point number two and three: uh, for you know, must be pure in God's valuation. You know how how does uh, how is our worldview revealed when how we answer the question about what God thinks about me? Well, your worldview is going to have everything to do with the question of whether or not uh, you believe in God or whether or not you approach an idea that you must be pure in the sight of God. I mean, if you just think about uh, the different worldviews, naturalism, atheism, existentialism, materialism, humanism, I mean, I mean the, you know, uh, theism, that's one, deism, uh, and I know some of those are subcategories of the same uh, but as, as we look at the way the world would ask this question, okay, how does an atheist answer the question, you must be pure in God's valuation? Well, you would say there is no God, therefore there is no objective moral standard for me to live. And within that atheism is humanism, existentialism, and naturalism. Uh, but with, uh, okay, this idea of deism uh, is the fact that there is a God, um, but he kind of wound this bad boy up and just let it go. And so, therefore, God doesn't really have a plan for me other than the fact that I just need to exist and do kind of whatever, kind of whatever's in front of me. Uh, You can go on uh, even different uh, uh, religions like Islam. Okay, in in the Islam's world, you got to do a lot of good things, but you can never be pure in God's valuation. So it doesn't matter. It matters, but I can't. Cannot know God. Uh, God is so far from me. And so uh, distant and transcendent that I could never, des- I could never I have an idea that I would ever have a relationship with him or be pure in his sight. And you can go on and on. I mean, this is just the world. Uh, but a Christian worldview says also that we can't be pure in God's valuation outside of Christ. So there is a way, but the way is outside of us. And the way is the life and the, the perfect purity of Christ being uh, imputed to us through or by the death of Christ on the cross in our place, and through us responding to him by faith in the work that he did that would make me pure in God's valuation. Now, let's say that we say, yes, I believe God has an objective standard, but then we might say the question that you mentioned, at least in the 9 a.m., saying, well, why did you do that? Well, well, God knows my heart. I said, okay, how should I approach God's objective standard on my life? Should I be kind of laissez-faire? Should I be hypocritical? What, where, what should I land? I, I'm, I don't know if I understand your question completely. Uh, how should I approach God's objective standard in my life? Is that, I mean... That's the question. Yeah. But it's kind of the alluding to, like, some people may answer, oh, well, you know, God knows yeah, my so heart. I, I guess that's what, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever I did, it, it makes sense because of my heart, not necessarily because of the outcome of what actually happened. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, you should care what God's Word says about everything. And about your decision-making, I just want you to think about this. Like, there's an objective standard for the decisions that you make and even the outcomes that they create. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why, like, things like manslaughter exists. Like, you may have not meant to kill that person, but you did. And so is the penalty for manslaughter less than the penalty of first-degree murder? Yes. Yes. But you still killed somebody. And so, yeah, yeah. So in the same way, God, God knows your heart, but it's still wicked. Like it, there may be different degrees depending on what the situation is, but the fact of the matter is we're guilty. And so we need to approach God's objective standard on life by saying God's word tells me has 
everything I need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him. And therefore, my life should be uh, devoted to God through being committed to his word and the Holy Spirit working through me as a Christian to live by the standards and statutes of the word of God. So that means we have to come meek and humble and ready to mm-hmm. be corrected and, and right. you know poked and prodded for our benefit, which is leads to point number two, accept your impurity before God. Mm. Something you said at the 9 a.m., I framed it into a question. Why must we accept our wretchedness in order to be gospel people? Yeah, well, that's the gospel, isn't it? I mean, that, that you know, I mean, I've heard people say it in different ways. Like, I'm just a blind leading, you know, I'm just, a, no, I'm just a beggar uh, pointing other people to where the bread is. You know, it's like, okay. That's great. Yeah, Sounds that's, like a very Texan thing to say. Well, it's, I mean, it's a concept that makes sense. Like Was you're, it founded in Texas? Yeah, I'd, I'd highly doubt it. I think it's in the Bible. No, it's not explicitly in the Bible. But the point being is like you're, you're, we're wretched, and that is the beauty of the gospel when responded to, that the wretched are made pure. And so we have to not only just accept it, but embrace that this is who we were and that Christ has made us children of God, and now where we are is not where we were. And so, I mean, I think that's so important uh, that we see our wretchedness before God. And that's and even that previous question we talked about in the last podcast about why is seeing my wretchedness before God truly freeing? Because, well, anybody who knows how condemned they truly were understand how freeing it is to be liberated. I use the example of the Nazi concentration camps with, you know, the Jews and the undesirables, you know, being... Uh, Condemned, wiped out. yeah, wiped out and condemned in these concentration camps, and yeah, and the millions that were murdered. It's like the ones who were liberated by the Allied forces. I mean, you ask them, well, why do you feel so free right now? Because I truly know what liberation and freedom is, and they knew that to to the extent that they did because of the condemnation that they were in and the uh, the critical situation they were in about to lose their lives in the same way it's like when you see that you were condemned before a holy god no way to be pure in his sight and that through christ your wretchedness could be turned to purity and you ask why can we be truly how can that be truly freeing because you understood the penalty you understood the cost that was paid and you understood the mercy and grace that was extended to you you see the gravity of the situation where Absolutely. we're not a lovable, you know, baby before God. No, we are an enemy actively rebelling against him who's Absolutely. angry at us. But yet he loved us so much that he sent his son to die in our place. Right. And so what a great love story that it was for God to take care of our problem. I like how you said the wall. Once we see really how big it is and how vast the chasm is, mm-hmm. don't we really appreciate actually getting to the other side Absolutely. of it? Yeah, for sure. So, which requires a response, which is point number three, respond to God's offer to purify you. So, uh, Pastor Aiden, you talked to two groups of people in, to, in the mm-hmm. audience uh, to us at Compass, was the believer and the unbeliever. Let's start with the unbeliever. How should the unbeliever apply point number three? There's only one way for an unbeliever to apply Scripture, and that's the first way, is to repent and place their trust in Christ. There's so many text that I didn't even get into all of the ones in the, in the scriptures that talk about the need for repentance, right? The need for us to turn away from our sin, place our trust in Christ for the salvation of our souls. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to have a, a short list over here somewhere. Uh, I'll look it up and talk about all the verses that talk about the need to repent, Right. Oh, we'll Mark one fifteen. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole list. I'm, I'm going to look some Acts of them chapter up. three, Acts chapter two. Here, I'll look them up for you. Uh, yeah, I mean, Matthew four seventeen is a good one uh, that we just talked about. Uh, Matthew nine thirteen talks about I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repent. Uh, I mean, Matthew, I mean, you can keep going on. Uh, Acts 3.19, repent and turn back that your sins may be uh, wiped out. The times of refreshing, the one I talked about today. Uh, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, but wishes that everyone would repent. Uh, Romans 2.3, that his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Uh, I mean, over and over again, you see it all throughout the scriptures, that there is a God... Uh, 
uh, says that the proper response to someone in their wretchedness and in their sin would be to respond by turning from that sin and placing their faith in Christ. So then, what is the response of the believer? And, right, and I think, and I, even at the 11, I believe I, I articulated this more clearly, uh, but man, and these same principles, even when it comes to the promise, the problem, and God's proposal, is exactly the same, at least in its form, for the non-Christian, although the function is, is different because the function of the unbeliever is a instantaneous justification before God, forensically righteous in the sight of God, uh, the application for the believer is uh, progressive righteousness or sanctification or that God is conforming you into the image of Christ from one degree of glory to the next, as Scripture says. And so for us, that, that's still the problem, isn't it? It's like, okay, we're not sanctified to the greatest extent possible, and so we know that every day of our life is being is us increasing in that sanctification and that progression in righteousness. So every day there is an extent to which I must recognize the three points of the sermon is I must be pure in God's valuation. Maybe I'm righteous in his sight because of Christ, but are my actions, is my life pure in God's valuation? Because when it's, when it's not, Hebrews tells me I'm going to receive the Lord's discipline. And so, okay, well, that discipline is meant to lead me to repentance and righteousness. Great. And so I need to be pure in God's valuation. Then I need to accept that I live frequently, and that's that humility and meekness you were talking about earlier, that I'm impure before God through my actions, and I need to turn from those. And then I need to respond to God's offer to purify me. It's at first, you know, First John 1, 9 talks about, uh, and 10 talks about that God wants to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that's not a, a salvation verse necessarily, unless I'm wrong. It's a, it's a verse about God wanting to sanctify you as a Christian if you will turn from your sin actions and, and, and turn to him that he wants to purify you. So, I mean, for a Christian, this is a significant sermon uh, because it's, it's not just for the unbeliever. This whole text is about you want to see God. You want to be in right relationship with God. You want to have that intimacy with God. You have to have a purity in your life that is both internal and comes to the external of a person because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth does speak. In another passage that we told your life group leaders is Ephesians four twenty two to twenty four, mm. where we need to put off the old self, which belongs to our former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, sin, mm -hmm. and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to be put, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, it's, it's another way to say it, a fancy way to say. Be conformed to Jesus. Right. And so it is an applicable sermon for us to make sure I'm repenting and having putting off my old self. I'm forsaking my old self, not salvifically, but sancti you know, sanctifyingly right. to put it off and to put on Christ more and more. And how? Having God renew my mind. Right. Reference to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Absolutely. And then finally, maybe, you know, for those who are sitting there who are after the sermon or maybe after the baptisms or after family matters or after Easter, you're sitting there going, I'm unsure if I have really responded in the way the Bible commands me to. Right. And hence the Bible. And we told your life group leaders about why we need to make sure scripture is supersedes our thoughts about ourselves. Absolutely. So what should I do if I'm sitting there kind of unsure going, I don't know, maybe I do maybe have a biblical testimony per se, but the Bible seems to be describing something different. I need to ask myself and examine my faith, as Paul says, uh, because at the end of the day, it is God who wills and works in your life for his good pleasure. And so to me, to examine my faith allows me to say, here's what I'm doing. I'm not questioning that God can save. I'm questioning, has God saved me? And I'm not going to sit here in, in this uh, persistent fear as a genuine Christian that I'm not saved. And uh, how do I know I'm saved? How do I know I'm saved? Because it's God who wills and works in you. And so, therefore, I know that God's going to produce righteousness in me. He's going to produce fruit in me through the power of his Spirit. But I've always got to make sure, does my testimony line up with a biblical testimony? Did I respond to the biblical gospel, or did I respond to something else? Did I have a religious experience, or did I respond to the biblical gospel, that Christ makes me righteous in the sight of God? And uh, maybe this is a good question to ask your life group leader, or struggle with this, wrestle with this through your life group leader, and, and have them help you. Uh, look at your life and your testimony in light of the biblical revelation that we have concerning the gospel and our response. 
All right. Well, Compass, we have application questions and yeah. we just want to exhort you, be sure that you go through these, uh, be prepared for life group. That is a way that you can love your life group by being prepared to share an encouraging word with mm-hmm. them through the application questions. Right. So be sure to do that. Uh, Pastor Aiden, what are some announcements that we have for our church? Yep. The announcements this week are uh, fourfold. Uh, child dedications on Mother's Day and Father's Day. So we want you, if you're listening to this, if you have any uh, kiddos who've never been dedicated to the Lord uh, a- 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 on stage at your local church, we'd love to do that. And it's an opportunity for the church uh, to pray for you. It's, a, it's an opportunity for you to commit to your church. You're going to raise your children in the wisdom and fear of the Lord. And so you can sign up either for the Mother's Day uh, dedication or the Father's Day dedication. We have so many kiddos that we had to have two. And so we want an opportunity for everyone to take part in this. But we don't want you to wait. We want you to go ahead and sign up as soon as possible so we know who's all going to be there at these child dedications. It's also a great opportunity to invite your family to church to be a part of that, especially if you want to have gospel conversations with them. What better opportunity than our child dedications? We also have our summer kids camps uh, coming up right around the corner, and the registration for each of them, the VBS, art, and science camp, are all now open at compasshillcountry.org slash kids. There are deadlines, June 4th for VBS, July 2nd for the art camp, and July 30th for the science camp. So make sure you sign up before the deadline so we can ensure that you have a spot for your kiddos to learn about the Lord uh, and celebrate God through different avenues of creativity. We have two announcements for students. One, we have students at the Evo on May the 6th, and so you can learn more about that at the website, or your students should have some information about that, or they can go to Evo Entertainment and fellowship together and have a good time uh, together uh, just next week. And so make sure that you have them signing up for that. Also, Student Revival Summer D Now, it's a stay camp. They'll be here locally. Uh, is on July the 27th, that's a Thursday, through Sunday, July 30th. We'll have a registration open soon, but we want you to save the date, and we want you to commit to making sure that your teens, they could be a lot of places this summer, but we want to make sure they're in the most important place they could be, and that's in front of the Word of God being taught consistently and faithfully uh, for God's glory and for their good. All right, Life Group leaders and church, we are so grateful for all of you. We're so grateful that you listened to this Equip podcast. We hope that it was good for you and edifying for you, and we look forward to meeting again next week. Thank you.